All right, good morning, everybody. So uh, uh, thanks to Mitsubishi for having me. I, I really appreciate it. And um, first thing I want to do is establish that I'm one of you guys. I'm not an academic. Uh, I started out, I graduated high school. College was never talked about in my family. So um, I put an ad in the paper that I used to deliver the year earlier. Uh, carpentry, call Larry, no job too small. And uh, I would get calls and I'd you know, show up and people wanted home repairs and you know, little things done. And uh, they'd always look at me like my age and you know, you, they're looking at me over, are you sure you know what you're doing? And I was like, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I learned quick and uh, so it was the building boom and it was 1982, uh, 83 and all the real carpenters were busy. So I got a call, hey, can you build me a house? And you know, I never built a house before, but I said, um, yeah, yeah. And so you know, I met the guy at Denny's, he laid out the plans, and, uh, and I, I built my first house when I was 18 years old. I framed roof, sided it uh, with my friend who was 17 years old and my younger brother who was 14 years old on summer vacation from high school. And uh, so, uh, amazing. And, but it was just because there was a building boom uh, in Connecticut. Now it's a ghost town. There's no building going on at all in Connecticut. Uh, but um, in any event, uh, I built 23 houses over the next five years. I was spec building, and uh, I learned a lot. And then the, bu the building bubble collapsed, and you couldn't build another house because you wouldn't be able to sell it. So um, the last house I built had a wall crack in the foundation that was leaking. So I had to figure out how to fix this wall crack. So I found myself in the basement waterproofing business. And I said, hey, here's a place where I could make my mark. And uh, we started specializing in that. <clears throat> it's a long story, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go. But here, uh, 35 years later, uh, we have 70 trucks on the road. We have a, a in total, $120 million business. We actually have 400 employees now. And uh, we're really, really proud of a lot of things that we've done. And, but what I've, what I've done since 1990 is develop a, a network of contractors who are dealers for us, uh, use our products, and we've trained them on how to be successful. And what I found early was that it's not the products that make you successful. Although, yes, having great products is awesome. It makes it easier for your salespeople and everything. But if you don't have good leadership, you're not going to you know, grow. Leadership is, is the, the key factor here. So anyway, so I'm 53 years old. I've been a contractor for more than two-thirds of my life. I have a little gray hair coming here, so I figure you're more likely to listen to what I have to say. And uh, what well, somebody told me one time, the definition of a professional is somebody that's from more than 50 miles away. So, you know, if you call somebody in that's from more than 50 miles away to talk to you, I mean, they must be a professional, right? Well, standing here, I'm from more than 1,000 miles away, all right? <laughs> so, I must be really good. Well, let's see. Let's see. You could be the judge of that. Um, so, why is my presentation called The Highest Calling? Well, uh, I wrote a book in 2009. It, it was voted best business book of 2010 at three different places. And... Uh, it is a story called The Highest Calling, and it's a, really a story about you. It's a story, it's an emotional story, and people learn, um, you know, when you learn emotionally, like when you live through something, you don't forget it, isn't that right? When you read a book and it's sort of, you know, informational, you know, we, we forget 90% of what we read, you know, in, in, in a week. But this is an emotional story, and um, the last line in the book is, when you create a successful business, you improve the lives of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of people, there is no higher calling. So, and I really believe that, you know, um, entrepreneurs are in a place where you can really do a lot of great in the world and uh, Im improve the lives of your customers, your employees, and, and for an entrepreneur to win, the customer has to win and the employee has to win. If they don't win, if the, both of those groups don't win, then the, the stakeholders and the business cannot win. And, of course, if you screw it up, you can make a big mess, too, for everybody. So there's a lot at stake here, but fortunately, how to do, how to do it right is known. So this is um, uh, a building that I just uh, completed. 
is our ninth building. We have nine buildings in Seymour, Connecticut. We own half of this commercial park, and it's a beautiful commercial park, as you can see. And this is a 77,000 square foot building, and this is the most incredible home improvement contractor building on the planet, okay? Just finished. $13 million facility. This facility, with the exception of the third floor, um, is only for our local services, okay? So I designed it, uh, and we have three wings, as you can see. Uh, at the top is A wing, in the middle is B, and then the bottom is C. So in A wing, I have our basement waterproofing operations and our uh, air sealing and insulation operations and our crack repair. In B wing, we have our structural foundation repair operations, our uh, concrete lifting uh, with uh, foam uh, operations, our spray foam operations and basement finishing. In C wing, I have electrical and all our service trucks. There's 18 of them and our mechanic. Now, the way the building is laid out, uh, on the ground floor in the middle of this T is all, we have these uh, big supply rooms and uh, our quartermasters are there in the morning handing out materials to the guys over white granite countertops out of the, um, out of the crib, okay? Because there's a sign on the wall that says, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And we know that that white granite countertop that they get their materials uh, over every morning is a, is a symbol of that. Um, we have our uh, production room where the guys can meet. It's called the craftsman room. We have a cafeteria downstairs and incredible locker rooms. On the second floor, um, and those windows that you see in that blue part at the top, that's the third floor. So the second floor, is all the offices. We have our marketing, our appointment center, our sales and production management, and our general manager and so forth. Now, all the production managers sit in the uh, office looking out big giant windows over the roofs of all their trucks. So they could see all the trucks that they're managing and they could see them you know, going and coming. So at ninth, and we don't have any extra trucks in this building. Uh, all extra trucks are kept up at other buildings, so basically at nine in the morning, if there's a truck left there, something went wrong. Okay, there was a cancellation, somebody didn't show up, what, what's the problem? But anyway, the, the, uh, it's perfectly set up for a home service, home improvement business. On the third floor is a big training center. It's all set up for training. We have a big theater, we can fit 250 people in one spot, and it's just uh, amazing. So this is our commitment to what we're doing locally, and it's been you know, 35 years in the making. Um, now this roof, I wanted to mention, this roof here uh, in the lower uh, left is Dr. Energy Saver. So one of our divisions is Dr. Energy Saver, and we are, and I, I, didn't, I obviously would have had a better slide, but I just figured I'd, I'd, I'd talk to you a little bit about that. So Dr. Energy Saver is a home performance uh, dealership network. So we started in 2009, and we wanted to, um, uh, bring home performance to the masses. And uh, we've since uh, simplified uh, one of our models to attic systems. So we have basement systems and attic systems. And that building is 40,000 square feet. It's the largest home performance training center in the world. And uh, you can, you're all HVAC contractors. You should visit us, check it out uh, anytime. We'd love to have you. But so I'm a, a building scientist and trainer as well in, in that business. And so I wanted to make a comment about what you guys are doing here. So I've identified the two most incredible um, problems in uh, American housing as far as home performance. And one is uh, vented dirt crawl spaces, which I created a business out of starting in 1998. But really the, the one that's the biggest problem is ducks and attics. That is the stupidest thing that you could do when you build a house. And I mean, you guys know this, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you have an, uh, you know, roof shingles that get heated up to 165 and the bottom of the roof deck is 145 and the air in the attic is 125. And there, here we have a, uh, an air handler that you know, cools the air down, drops the air temperature 25 degrees or so and we send you know, 52 degree air through these tubes in this heated space that has R6 insulation with a 75 degree delta between inside and outside the duct. Hello, right? 
somebody needs to say to the world, the emperor has no clothes here, okay? This is a bad idea. Besides the fact that we have 47% on average of uh, convective losses, duct leakage in the attic, we have conductive losses as well. And you know, we require R60 insulation between the uh, condition space and the attic, R60, with a 50 degree delta at the most, and yet we have only R6 between the ducts and the attic with a 75 degree delta, right? Doesn't make any sense. So Mitsubishi ductless systems, which I own in my own home and my own brand new barn, uh, eliminate the ducts altogether. That's awesome. So in, in my view, you guys are on the nose cone of a rocket ship here, and your future is very bright, so give yourselves a hand. Okay, so, um, so I have, I'm gonna talk to you today about some ideas from our School of Entrepreneurship. And uh, it's a, the School of Entrepreneurship started a year and a half ago, two years ago, but again, 35 years in the making here. Uh, I have lived this life, you know, I, I've, I've struggled with all the things you guys have struggled with in the past. And um, one thing that has changed that has allowed me to grow my business to where it is today is I've changed. I become a different leader. I become a different thinker. I've learned new things. I've directed my attention uh, to different parts of my business and directed my people's attention to different parts of my business so that we could uh, get different results. If I didn't change, my business wouldn't change. So I created this curriculum, uh, the School of Entrepreneurship, and we started having live classes. Um, it was two years ago. And we had contractors come. We have about 100 contractors in the live classes. Some of them have been with us for uh, the, the full almost two years now. And then we decided to make an online platform to eliminate the travel, because they were traveling from California, Canada, everywhere to Connecticut for these live classes, and still do to this day. And uh, so we made an online platform, so it eliminates the travel, and it's cheaper. The, the live class was $1,500 a month. The online class is $500 a month. But I'll talk more about that, but just give you a, a, a little overview here. Okay, so um, the first thing uh, that I want to talk about is what is the problem with contractors, okay? Um, you, you know, in general, I think we don't have a, a great reputation with homeowners, I think, in general. Not, of course, not the people in this room. but. Uh, and one of the problems is that we started doing the work. You know, we, we were a technician. We were, we were the, uh, the, 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 you know, I used to wear the tool belt, right? I mean, I could frame a house for you right now, you know? And so I, we know how to do that. And so in the beginning, we have this, you know, this winning strategy. And the winning strategy is we're going to work longer and we're going to work harder and we're gonna make this thing work, right? We are gonna to tough it out. We're gonna work harder than anybody. We'll do whatever it takes to make our business survive, right? So we learned very early that working longer and working harder is what we should be doing as the owner. So that's our winning strategy in the beginning. And it, you know, it kind of works in the beginning because when we're one of three employees, if we're doing the job of two employees and we only have two others, so we're half the workforce, Right, it, it can make it a difference in the bottom line, okay? Well, our winning strategy has become our losing strategy as we grow. As we got 10 employees and 15 employees and 20 employees, if we don't come up with a new strategy and redefine our job, this is gonna be a losing strategy. And the reason it's gonna be a losing strategy is because we're working ourselves to death, we're frustrated, we're burnt out, we're working 80 hours a week, we have no time at home, okay, our spouse is not happy, our kids, you know, I mean, it's just not gonna work very well when we're working 80 hours a week, right? Um, and worse than that, uh, we're ignoring the other 12 employees. You know, our job is really to get the most out of those employees, yet what we're trying to do is work harder and work longer, work harder and work longer. And what, we, what winds up happening is we're the worker, we're the, the chief communications, you know, switch, and we're working really hard, and we have 11 helpers, basically, instead of, you know, these people who are empowered to do the work and get results with the customers, and we're leading them. 
So our winning strategy has become our losing strategy. And the, and the number one problem is that we've failed to redefine our job. Right? We're doing the job for the company that we were or maybe the company that we are. We're not doing the leadership job for the company that we want to be. You know, and, and you can't be the company you want to be without being the leader of the company you want to be before it happens. Okay, so the leader has to continually evolve and, uh, and get better. And if that doesn't happen, then you know, the, the company's stuck. When the company's stuck, you can find, if a company's stuck, you can find a leader who's stuck. Or if a leader's stuck, you can find the company is also stuck. So the leader must not fail to do the leadership job. Uh, you know, no one is going to come into your office and say, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Owner, I don't like the way you're doing the job. You're not doing the leadership job. Well, why don't you just step aside, okay? I'm one of your employees and I'll do the job, right? Nobody's gonna say that to you, right? You're the only one that can do the leadership job. You're the only one that's charged to do it, and you're the only one that uh, can, can make that happen. So if you fail to do that job, then there's gonna be problems. Um, for example, um, I, I tell people in the School of Entrepreneurship, if you wanna make uh, $400,000 a year, for example, just throwing out numbers, okay? If you wanna make $400,000 a year profit, then you have to refuse, that's $200 an hour, you have to refuse to do any job that's worth less than $200 an hour. Now, if I'd ask you guys honestly, do you find yourself during the day doing jobs that are worth less than $200 an hour? And I bet most of you would say, yeah. You know, like customer-facing jobs are worth less than $200 an hour. You can hire somebody to talk on the phone, you can hire somebody to sell, you can hire somebody to be a production manager, obviously to go out in the field and so forth, for you know, 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour. You know? So if you're doing those jobs, that component of your time, you're not doing the job that you need to do to make the income that you wanna make, right? So it's a no wonder you're not making it. So you have to refuse to do any job that's worth less than $200 an hour. Now you might say, oh, wait a minute, there's no job in my company that pays $200 an hour. I would not hire anyone and pay them $200 an hour. Yes, that's true. But there is one job that pays $200 an hour, and it's called leader. That's the job. That's the only job that pays $200 an hour, and you have to do that job, that job, correctly. Um, so what is your job? What is that leadership job? Well, it is setting goals, right? Getting a vision, getting the right people, right? So many of you, if I asked you how many people have, have trouble getting you know, good employees and keeping them, most every contractor says, yeah, I have trouble with that, okay? Well, that's a, a key result area. That's something that you have to, to focus on. Uh, getting everybody to do the right jobs with the right processes and systems so that they can get the results you're looking for with your customer. That's the leadership job. Not doing the work, but getting them to do the work, right? Uh, and motivating people, to get people to operate in the top of their performance ranges. You know, if everybody has a performance range, so picture this is me, I have a performance range. When I'm, when I'm turned on, when I'm engaged, I can operate here, right? But when I'm disengaged, you know, I, I can operate here, right? And I can be downright, you know, destructive, okay? So where is, is the leader gonna pull out of, the, out of this guy's operating range, right? So here's Jose, and here's Sally, and here's her operating range, and here's Bill, and his operating range is here. He doesn't get really mean or nasty or anything, but, you know, when he's disengaged, but man, he could be a superstar, and here's this other one. Everybody has different operating ranges, right? And we compensate for that with different pay. We don't pay everybody the same. But if your number one expense is labor, and you can get 20% more performance and results out of the people that you have, there's your profit right there. You know, so we have to get the right people on the bus here and then get them operating at the top of their performance ranges to, to do things because they want to do it, to commit to this place, to this leader, right, and, and uh, get the results that we're looking for. So your job is team builder. That's your job. Uh, 
you know, we have to build, you know, unless you want to own a job. I mean, one of the first things we do at the School of Entrepreneurship is determine what are, what are your personal goals? If your personal goals is, look, I want it to be me and two helpers and somebody in the office, and that's all I want forever, awesome. You know, you could do that. You know, you have to know what do you want to be when you, when you grow up so you're not confused and going in, you know, the wrong direction. So the first thing you got to do is benchmark where are we now, how do we get here, okay, what decisions and choices did I make along the way to get here, and where do I want to go personally first, and then I decide what I have to do in my business to get there. Um, we say that an entrepreneur spends the first part of his career being desperately underpaid. Isn't that true? How many know that you can be desperately underpaid? Yeah. Uh, and so that in a wild gamble, if he gets it right, they can spend the last part of their career being wildly overpaid. Being wildly overpaid. And, you know, results don't come for entrepreneurs in tidy little 12-month packages like employees, right? The, if for an employee at the end of 12, you know, the year, they get their, their W-2 and he says, oh, this is, you know, what you made. Well, for an owner, no, 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 it doesn't happen in 12-month taxable packages, right? Although you do file a tax return every year, but your results come over really a much longer term, like decades, right? And so if we can spend the beginning part of our career uh, re building this business, building our talent, reinvesting in our business so that we can maybe earn, when we start making money, four times the average American salary in a year. The next year, seven times the average American salary in a year. This is after six years of making nothing, right? Or more, if we didn't get it right. The next year, maybe 10 times the average American salary in a year. The next year, maybe 15 or 20 times the average salary in a year as our just reward for having built this apparatus that gets these results with these customers. And then when we get to that income level, our job then is to string those years together without screwing it up or sell the business when we're ready. So that's how we got to look at this journey as a business owner over a long time frame. And we have to understand what we're doing when and why. We want to own a business that works even if we don't show up. Isn't that right? Otherwise, we own a job. And owning a job is worse than having a job. Actually, I'd rather work for somebody else, you know, if I was going to make a salary uh, and not have all the risk and headache and so forth, uh, rather than, you know, uh, going to work and having all the responsibility and so forth and, and, and taking a chance that I, I could lose money. And uh, so we, we want to build a business that works without us, that gets a result, that we have people doing all the customer-facing jobs, that gets a result even if we don't show up. And I can tell you this, look, I have 160 employees at my local service business and everything's going fine today. I didn't get one phone call. In fact, I didn't get a phone call yesterday, or the day before that, or the day before that either. And I didn't even step foot in the building, okay? Um, and I have other businesses that run the same way. I don't have to show up. So when you do it right, you are free to do your creative projects, uh, which is what I do. I work on new content, I work on the future, but because I'm not, you know, stuck doing, you know, keeping the business that I've already had going on life support, saying, man, I got to keep this thing going to feed this thing because we got to pay our bills at the end of the week, you know, and I'm scrambling all the time. So that's what we want to do when we uh, create um, a business is have one that works without us. <clears throat> because, you know, at the end of the, at the end of our career, we want to have something that's, someone else wants to buy. I mean, if we're a slave to the business, right, and without us, if we walk out the door, uh, everything goes to hell, we own a job. And, like, who wants to trade places with us, right? Who wants to trade places with you? Who wants to buy that? Who wants to live your life, right, and pay you for the privilege? Or I've had business owners say to me, well, I was going to, you know, groom my son to take this thing over, but I wouldn't wish this on him, you know? <laughs> uh, 
And man, you know, that's, that's harsh. Uh, so, okay, so we start out with our personal goals. And we got to know, what are our personal goals? How many hours a week do we want to work? So let's establish that first. And believe it or not, you can craft a business where you work 40 hours a week. It might seem like part-time to a lot of you, but you can, you can actually work 40 hours a week and have an incredible business. All you've got to do is define what your leadership job is and take the top 40% most important things, most vital things, and uh, top 40 hours worth, and just delegate the rest. But you've got to have a team to de delegate to. We also want your, to know what your personal income goals are and what you like to do, because as a leader, you have a choice, you know? Maybe you just want to be leader, trainer, recruiter. Maybe you say, you know, I love production management. I want to do the, be the owner and the production manager, or I want to be the owner and the sales manager. So let's define what do you love to do, okay? A lot of times when we own a business, we're forced to do things we don't like to do because, you know, maybe you're strong in production or you're strong in marketing or sales or something, but now you, you're responsible for everything and you're forced to do things you don't like and it makes, you, you know, you don't like your job. So we need to define what are your personal goals because your business is a vehicle for you to accomplish your personal goals. Isn't that right? I mean, let's go back to the beginning here, okay? You started your business, why now, all right? Because you wanted to have a better life, all right? What is that better life, right? You're not because you don't want to have a worse life or you wanted to be a, a slave to the business, but because you want to be master over it, right? Uh, entre an, being an entrepreneur is the power to create oneself. The power to create oneself. You know, when you're an employee, you have to go to work, you have to be there at 8 o'clock, whatever. I, I, I have to work till this time. I have to, you know, achieve these things and meet these standards and so forth. But when you're an entrepreneur, Nobody's telling you what to do. Right? You could do whatever you want. You could make this business go to the moon or you could do nothing with it. You could, you know, everything in between. You could make it go this way, that way, the other way. You could work 20 hours a week, 120 hours a week. You could do whatever you want. This is the power to create oneself. And we should be able to use our business to really live an extraordinary life, right? That's what we want to do. Look, we're living in the United States of America in 2017. The cards are stacked in your favor, okay? This is our moment, right? This is our time. And you can do this, right? How to do it is known. So you just need to find out how to do it to accomplish what it is that you say that you want. And look, I don't mean to say that so many of you in here aren't doing extraordinary things. Your, your, your businesses are doing really well. So I'm speaking to the person and the business and the dream that you have that has not come true yet, right? There, we have so much more potential inside of us and the boundaries is, will never be known. But hey, you know what? We go around once. I have this, uh, I always have this idea in me and I talk about it on my blog, uh, Think Daily. I have a, a, a message of the day. It's very short, it's called Think Daily. And you could sign up for it on thinkdaily.com. It's free. And there's Think Daily for business people. So you might want to write that down, thinkdaily.com, and sign up. But, um, you know, we go around once, right? We, we make the class, School of Entrepreneurship, we have a timeline. And we say, okay, here's the time I spent in school. Here's the time I spent work for somebody else. Here's the time when I start my business. Then put an arrow at what age you want to retire. And you see there's, there's a pretty small gap between <laughs> where you are now and, and the age you want to be done with this. It's like, if you were ever gonna get this thing right, <laughs> when do you think would be the best time, right? If an entrepreneur you know, can get this income, like the sooner in life you can get this income, make this business work for you, the better, right? You have more years to string together. Because look, to make your dreams come true, you're gonna need some extra money. That's, that's the fact, right? To do incredible things with your family and then you know, uh, in the end you're gonna give it away and help other people and stuff. You know, there's only one thing better than a, a good person. It's a good person with money, okay, right? So, uh, all right, so we have this model, it's called the business machine, and um, it is our functional model. So we have a physical, functional, and financial models at the School of Entrepreneurship, and they're absolutely scalable. You can, you're gonna use this to make a $1 million company. We have uh, contractors who've used this to grow to $42 million. And it can go to $100 million. It's, it's 
absolutely completely scalable. So here's how it works, okay? And we created this, I created this in 2005, and we've been using it, all our contractors use this model to think about how their business works. And we hang all kinds of things on this. We hang key performance indicators on it, we hang you know, how we divide the duties, the management, the interaction of the departments, um, and goal setting. At the beginning of the year, we have this um, uh, exercise every year called visual ambition, uh, it's like as opposed to blind ambition, right? Visual ambition. We can see what we're doing and we use this model to set goals for the next year. So if, the, if your business, if you were like the jolly green giant, you walked up to a building and ripped the roof off and you look down and you look at the different functions in, inside there, this is what you would see. These are the, the what, what you would see. So we have seven gears and the gears are uh, in the size of relative importance um, there. And the top gear is marketing. So we have an input into marketing. It's called advertising in dollars, right? You invest money in advertising. And we have a marketing manager write their name here. And we have key performance indicators. Um, and that is number of leads generated and cost per lead. And then the marketing department produces leads. You see the output, that a black arrow, output of the marketing department is leads. Well, where do those leads go? Well, they go to the appointment center. And you're like, the what? Yeah, the appointment center. Uh, that is uh, where they take in any inquiries, any leads, and convert them into appointments. Because essentially that's what we need, is appointments. We have salespeople, we have installation people and service people. We gotta get those people working, right? If they're not in front of customers, they're not working, right? We gotta get them in front of customers and we gotta manage schedules. So uh, the appointment center, we have an appointment center manager, we'll talk more about that. Then we. Their output is sales appointments. Where do they go? Well, to the sales department. And the sales department has a sales manager and they have their KPIs, we'll talk about that. And their output is confident, engaged customers, okay? So they're not installed yet, but they're engaged. They're saying, yes, come work for me. Um, the office is a little tiny gear. And the office, you know, if you ask them, they think they're the center of the universe, but really their job is to just enable the other departments. And typically in office, we have IT and HR. That, that, that's all that's in the office gear. Then we have accounting. Their job is to give financial feedback to the rest of the gears and obviously do all the accounting things that they do. I'm, and I'm going fast here because I don't want to run out of time. That happens. I could talk for days. And uh, I often do in our classes, but I have to make sure I don't run out of time here. So um, production is a big gear because that's what people pay us for, right? Mr. and Mrs. Jones don't care about accounting. They don't care about marketing. They don't care about your all the things that go on inside your company, or even if salespeople get paid. They only care about what Tom and Bob and Bill do when the time they get out of the truck to the time they get back in the truck at their house, right? So production is really important. And so we have a production manager. And then service is, uh, in many of you are service companies, so in your model, the service gear would be bigger and maybe new installations or production would be a smaller gear. But um, So the cash flow comes off of uh, production and service, right? That's where the cash flow comes from. It doesn't come off any of the other, other gears, but you have to have them. So I would ask you, if we pulled any one gear out of this model, what would happen, right? It would stop. Or if we were missing teeth on some of the gears, right? One, one uh, department wasn't operating well, if it was marketing, or if it was sales, or if it was appointment center, right? If it was production, then the whole machine would slow down, we'd have problems, right? So our output of our entire company would be, the limit would be um, our weakest function, our weakest department. So we can't have that. Um, so let me go to our financial model, which is uh, not very complicated. It's leads times closing ratio times average sale times sales per customer, which is your service component equals total sales times net margin as a percentage equals profit in dollars. And so it's, it's very simple. And if we want to make more money, we just, like you could plug in all your numbers from last year in here. And if you want to make more money, you just start messing with the numbers. You say, well, if our leads went up by 10%, if we could do 10% better in marketing and we could have a 3% um, better closing ratio and a, you know, 5% better average sale. It's amazing what happens when you go through this, this uh, analogy, uh, you know, this um, uh, model. 
So, by the way, please make notes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you something, so whether you engage with us or not in the School of Entrepreneurship, I'm giving you some valuable ideas here. So please, you know, take notes and uh, uh, use this stuff for your benefit. Um, okay, so um, what is ADL? So this is a key measurement uh, I came up with a long time ago. People talk about closing ratio. Uh, but that's not a good measure of a uh, salesperson. It's um, ADL. Because one salesperson might have a low closing ratio, but a really high average sale. And another one has a high closing ratio, but he's selling scared and he's selling little, little jobs. So ADL is average dollar per lead. And what we do is we take total sales divided by number of leads run in that period. So let's say I give Joe 20 leads this month. And Joe comes back with $60,000 in business. His ADL is $3,000. So on average, every time he knocks on a door to give a proposal, he is selling $3,000 worth of business, right? And I can compare that number to other salespeople in the, in the company. I can compare it to a company average. I can set goals around it and so forth. Now, if I want to find out what's wrong with his ADL, you know, how can I get it better? I can then break it down, look at his closing ratio and his average sale. But ADL is really what I'm concerned about because it's return on lead flow. And so if I get slow, slow season, guess who gets you know, less leads first? Well, the ones with the lowest ADL and the ones with the highest ADL, I keep them in the chips. They're getting leads you know, all the time. What is ADS? It's average dollar per stop. This is how we measure in our service department. So on average, every time the service truck uh, drives up to a house, how much money is he bringing in on average? And then I can measure the effectiveness of my service department. I can compare each other. I can set goals. I could uh, determine strategy and so forth. So that's how we measure. And I think what you measure is really important because it, it puts the whole organization's attention on a given number. And if you direct their attention to the wrong number, they're going to be trying to improve the wrong thing. So. What, what you measure, I think, is, is, has always been very important to us. We have a program inside the School of Entrepreneurship called Six Roles of the Appointment Center. And um, uh, here's the six roles, okay? So this is the, the uh, uh, people in the office that are answering the phone, okay? But what we've done, it, you know, it sounds so simple. Oh, yeah, well, they answer the phone. If somebody wants an appointment, you know, we schedule the appointment. What's the big deal? Yeah, well, it's a, a source for it. It's a huge hole in the net in most businesses, you know. You don't answer the phone on lunch hour, you know. You, uh, you, know, you don't have enough phone lines and, you know, people get busy signals or, you know, people don't know how to set the appointment. They're given uh, uh, ballpark estimates over the phone and, you know, so forth. You, that's all got to be stopped, okay. We got to go for 100% conversion from somebody has an, an interest, they have a concern to an appointment, right? Always. And so this is, this is, there's the six roles of the appointment center. And for each of these, we have scripts. And uh, they're simple, doesn't have to be complicated, but they're very distinctly different functions. Okay, so catcher, what does a catcher do? Catcher catches incoming calls and sets the appointment. Sounds simple, right? But there's certain things that we train them on uh, to make sure that they, they do that effectively and they don't blow it. Um, recycler, what's that? Well, that's when somebody had an appointment and they canceled. You know, hey, oh, I have to cancel. The kid's sick or I got called into work or something. So they canceled. Do you just say, okay, thanks. Call us back when you're ready. You know, I mean, no, you got to recycle it, whether you do it on the spot or you do it later. But recycling is scheduling appointments that we had booked that canceled before we got there. Surfer, really important. Your number one lead source should be internet. We have a whole internet marketing agency inside of our business. We have 80 people working on the internet. We manage 450 websites for contractors. And um, you know, we, we, we'd be happy to talk to you about that service if you're interested in having us do your internet marketing. Uh, it's an, we have an incredible team and an incredible interface how this thing works between you and us. Um, so the Surfer, uh, schedules internet leads. And 50% of internet leads come as a phone call on the screen, about half, and the catcher gets those, but the surfer gets the other ones. So there's a way, you gotta have your computer set up where you are calling that customer back before they even get to your competitor's website. 
Okay, that lead comes in and you're dialing and they're like, oh, I just pressed send. <laughs> yeah, and we're calling you back to right now. You know, so it's speed is critical with, with the surfer role. Showtime is when you do shows, not just home shows, but you, you can do all kinds of shows. You can do boat shows and sporting shows and all kinds of shows, but um, the showtimers are working with people on the show floor to set appointments immediately. Again, timing is, is very, very important. Perennials are doing service, uh, scheduling annual maintenances and your, your, uh, your services uh, and for your service department. And a hunter is calling back on unsold proposals to try to close the job on the phone or to um, schedule a revisit for a salesperson, whether it be the original salesperson or a different one, to go back there and try to close the sale. So those are the six roles of the appointment center, and they're very distinctly different roles with distinctly different rules of the road, if you will, that we train on at the School of Entrepreneurship. And it's, it was absolutely a game changer, and there's hundreds of contractors across America using this. Um, I spoke about our Treehouse Internet Group. If, you're, if we do your internet marketing, which that's a whole different thing. So we have School of Entrepreneurship. The internet marketing is different. We can do your internet marketing without you being in the school, or you could be in the school without us doing the internet marketing. But um, so we have a way where you can put in valuable local content. You know, you're going to have a marketing director, and they have all these uh, little software programs that are called widgets that we created that they could put in testimonials, before and after pictures. Um, case studies, white papers, all kinds of content that Google values that says, wow, this is a good place to send traffic to so you can build up your organic traffic and improve your conversion rate. The thing about internet, there's, there's two factors. One is traffic, how much traffic do you get? And the other is conversion rate, which is overlooked a lot. And so the industry average converts at about 3%, 3.5%. Uh, our sites convert over 7%. So out of 100 visitors, you're getting seven leads as opposed to three and a half before because of what we're showing them when they get to your site, uh, which is we change based on what they're looking for and where they sit, geo-targeting. Um, so there's, there's so much more to that story. I'd be glad to talk to you about it and put you in touch with the right people who can sort of give you the, the lay of the land there as to what we do. We'd be very happy to do that for you. Um, we have a finance company inside our company, and uh, I see you have Synchrony here. That's awesome. And so long as you're offering financing, uh, because financing improves the customer's buying power with you. So if your competitor is not offering financing, and you are, they can afford your job, but they can't afford their job, right? Even though yours might be more expensive, they can afford yours, but not theirs, because you're offering financing every time. So financing is a really important part of the whole sales uh, effort. Okay, so just in its totality, I'll get to what, what is Contractor Nation, and that's us, but we have basement systems uh, for basement waterproofing, total basement finishing for uh, basement finishing, Dr. Energy Saver, which I spoke about for home performance, uh, and Attic Systems is sort of Dr. Energy Saver light. It's uh, an opportunity you could jump right into very easily to Attic Systems. We can do $5,000 jobs in a day, like clockwork. Okay, and so it's an awesome, you know, it's air sealing and insulation, but we do it, uh, you know, our way. We have our methods, and uh, it's uh, been very successful. Um, we have our, our financing, our internet group, clean space, which is crawl space encapsulation, which we uh, basically invented. Um, and the School of Entrepreneurship, which is the live classes, and the School of Entrepreneurship online, which is the program that I want to get you guys involved with right here at this event. Um, inside the School of Entrepreneurship, we have a complete sales program. Okay, we're really good at sales. We have to be, because the winners are not the ones who can install the work. Because let's face it, all your competitors are out there telling people they can install the work too. So who wins? The ones who get the leads and can sell the jobs. That's who the ones, the ones that win, right? The best marketed and, and, and uh, organizations and the, and the best sales-driven organizations win. So that's where you gotta you know, steer your focus in a very big way and differentiate yourself from everyone else. So perfectus is a Latin word. It means success and progress. Don't, don't let it, you know, uh, uh, it's not that complicated. We try to keep things simple at the School of Entrepreneurship. Look, you know, contractors, in, including me, you know, it's like, we, man, we got a lot to do, right? 
And the last thing I want to do is give you, make your life more complicated. We make it simpler, and we break it down piece by piece, make it simple. So um, I don't have time, I don't think, to, uh, I'm going to make up some time by sort of skipping the whole Perfectus uh, conversation here. But basically, when we go into a house, we have to build credibility. You know, there's a whole, you know, confirmation call process, there's a whole arrival process. But we have to build credibility early so that people know that we are the experts, that we're the pros, right? So that it changes their listening very early in the sales process. Then we've got to do a customer interview and find out what their motivations are. And we've got to do a very detailed customer interview so we can find out all their reasons for buying. Then we develop an accomplish list. What do they actually want to accomplish? Very specifically, and we agree on that. And they say, yes, that's what I want to accomplish. And we say, okay, now we know what they want to accomplish and they're clear what they want to accomplish. So that becomes the buying criteria. Then we do a masterful inspection. And um, um, masterful demonstration as to what the problems are. Okay, so they have to know what the problems are, particularly in your business, because heat is invisible, right? So they can't say, you know, one of my businesses, you know, water, you're standing in water on the floor, you can see it, that's a problem, but, you know, you gotta show them all the problems. And I, I developed this, a, uh, an app called the Heat Mapper. Just uh, recently, we rolled it out our annual convention. We have a big convention. In, uh, in September, it's 1,400 people, just got over two weeks ago, and I rolled this thing out, and the heat mapper is where we take uh, measurements uh, through building assemblies and ducts and attics, for example, and we show the losses. We could literally show the losses as a percent as the air is going through the duct farther and farther, we're losing more and more, a heat gain, heat loss, uh, and showing them. And if the customer knew how bad this was, they would take action, right? But they don't really know, right? And it's sort of this black magic. So we gotta be really good at doing a masterful uh, uh, explanation as to what the problem is. And then we do a masterful presentation. We take them shopping piece by piece. And then w we ask for the business. And if they, when they say no, or I wanna think about it, I wanna sleep on it, I wanna pray on it, I wanna talk to my brother-in-law, I wanna you know, uh, get another estimate, all these are no. Uh, <laughs> We, we train our salespeople to have a strategy. What do you say next? And we, we differentiate between high pressure sales and low pressure sales. High pressure sales when all the focus is on the product. Low pressure sales when all the focus is on the customer and we're asking questions. So I can close you by asking questions, right? And it feels very natural to the homeowner. Um, and so we have this whole thing called the closing trail and we, um, there, when, when you make a sale, there's four sales you have to make. Do it at all. Do it right, don't shortcut, right? Don't put a Band-Aid on it, do it right. Do it with our company, don't do it with another company, okay? And those three are typically the easier ones, right? Oh yeah, John, you know, you sound good, you know, everything looks good, look good proposal. You know, I mean, you're a great company, I'll get back to you. Because we didn't make the fourth sale, and the fourth sale is do it now, right? So we gotta build some urgency in there, we gotta get them to do it now, isn't that right? So we have a way of doing that with a preferred uh, customer discount and how we present it there. And then after that, there's, you know, any, any salesman can find out reasons for buying. But what we got to find out is reasons for not buying in the end, right? And we have to do everything right up to this point, but we got to find out why are they not buying. And there's three uh, types of objections, think, shop, and money objections, right? And so we train our people how to handle if they say, I'm getting, I want to get another estimate or how to handle, I have the money, I just don't know if I want to spend that much on the project right now. I don't know if it's worth that much to me. That's a value of, of objection. Or it's a money objection, and money objections come in a number of different forms. I, I want to do it, but I'll have the money later. Uh, I um, have the money, um, uh, but I don't want to spend it on the project right now. Or I want to do the project, I just don't have the money right now. So anyway, we, we train salespeople how to do that. We have a, a, an exercise, one of many, many, many exercises called visioneering. So we had to create a vision which is aspirational. What do we want to be? If we had our way with the whole world, what would that look like? A mission which is actionable. What are we trying to do every day when we come to work? And our values. What do we value while we do our work? And we have to create those as a leader because you know, so many, the key to your growing is you getting the right people and getting them to stay. Isn't that right? If you, can get, if you had 20 of the best people tomorrow start to work for you, you could take over the world, right? And, and they were gonna stay and commit, right? And, 
and not have one foot out the door, right, and say, well, I'm looking for another job. I'll stay here while, you know. So you got to ask yourself, is your recruiting problem, is it you? Like, if I have a family, and, I, and I'm a good employee, I know I'm a good employee. I could work anywhere, anywhere I want. Why would I bet my future and my family's future on you? Do, do I say, are you going to take me and my family to the promised land? Are you the kind of leader who's going to be here in 10, 15 years? You want me to commit for 10 or 15 years? Do I see that you're committed for 10 or 15 years? That you're doing everything you can to lead this ship, to, to, you know, using high standards and values, and you have a vision for the future, and you're betting your uh, life and fortune on that future? Right? If you're not doing that, you don't deserve the best employees. They're not going to work for you. In fact, the best ones are going to leave if you're a mess as the leader, or, you know, I don't mean a total wreck, but they're saying, I don't know about the future with this company, right? The best ones will leave because they have choices, and the worst employees will stay because they have no choice, right? And then you get what you get. You wind up with what you got. So we have to, you got to be a different kind of person to get out of this. All right, so... Here's something, if you got a pen in your hand, take notes. So this is uh, in, the, in the area of financial um, literacy and, and uh, making sure we don't get in trouble. So financial statements are history books, right? It's like looking in a rearview mirror. There's nothing you can do about it. By the time you get your financial statement, you can't change the numbers. That's what happened last month or two months ago, right? So what we want to do is look out the windshield of our, you know, our financial picture. So what I recommend is you measure your spread every month. So spread is cash plus receivables minus payables. So if I add all my cash plus everybody that owes me money for work that's completed minus my payables, everything I owe everybody else, I get a number, it's called a spread. So start measuring it every month, same time every month, first week of every month. And you'll find that there's gonna be changes. The first month you measure it doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? My spread is 74,000, I don't know what that means. Next month, you'll see a change, and then you'll see a change, and then you'll see a change, and you'll start to see, am I going in the right direction or the wrong direction? And you'll ask why. What happened this month that I'm $20,000 worse financial position than I was at this time 30 days ago, right? And then you can make decisions about our backlog and how much salary you take at that time of year. It doesn't change how much you make in a year, but you don't want to drain your company of cash, right? You're out of cash, you're out of business. So you might be able to take, you know, a distribution of you know your your salary plus five thousand dollars a week in July, but then you know in September you take zero, right? And then another month you might take eight thousand dollars a week. So you can make those decisions based on what your spread is and manage your cash. So you don't get any surprises when you get your financial statements. There's no surprises. There's a whole um, and I know I'm talking fast, uh, and I appreciate you. Am I doing good? By the way. Okay. Uh, so, trying to give you a peek at what is available in the school and what's available to you to grow your business, to, to solve your problems. These problems are solvable, right? So, the best leaders, the biggest contractors aren't smarter than you. They just know something you don't know yet that they're implementing, right? So you can do this too if you just make up your mind to be that kind of person that tunes in to the right stuff. All right, so we have a whole uh, hiring program called Hire, Hire. And we have it set up to where multiple people can be involved in hiring. So this is what we call a recruiting card. And the first thing we do is we establish what are the qualities we want in a candidate for this uh, for this job and the ideal candidate. Then we start populating the, uh, the first column with candidates from the internet and collect resumes and so forth. Then we do a resume screening and we start screening them out. And you can see the ones with the red X, they didn't make the cut to go to the next step. Then we do a phone screening and we screen more out. And now we have far less to interview and we interview and we screen them out and we go to the second interview and a group interview and a background check and a previous employer interview if applicable and then we pick one. And so what this system does, it, it, it does a lot of things but it allows multiple people to be involved 
and it makes sure you don't miss anything. When you hire fast, and when you don't do the hiring job thoroughly, you're gonna make mistakes, and you gotta live with that mistake, right? You hire somebody, you gotta live with them. They are your company, you know, eight, 10 hours a day for the rest of your life. So that, this is one area where I think contractors don't spend enough time and don't see it as the you know, super important activity that it is. So we give you tools to do that. There's also a um, candidate folder. So this is a folder that has pockets in it, and in the middle there's pages with all the questions that you ask on the, on the phone screening and the uh, first interview and the second interview and the group interview. All the pages are there, and there's different questions for different kinds of employees. For You're hiring somebody for marketing, you're hiring somebody for sales, somebody for production or service. There's different questions for them to see uh, and you ask all the candidates for that job the same question so you can get a, a sense of what a good answer is and what a bad answer is. So anyway, it's a whole uh, complete system that allows you to hire the best people. Um, there's a whole program inside the School of Entrepreneurship for management training. So you have these, so you, you had your functional model, right? Marketing, appointment center, sales, production, service. What if you had expert managers in each of these departments? that could do the job extremely well, that could manage those people in those departments. Wouldn't your life be a lot easier? Do you think that me standing here not getting one phone call, I could stand here for a month and not get a phone call from my local business. And do you think that's possible if I don't have expert managers in each of these areas who are really doing a great job and taking care of things? So we teach you how to train your managers what to do. And this is an important point. About half the material in the School of Entrepreneurship is for you, the leader, the owner, the thinker, right? And the other half is for you to present directly to your people. So the sales system, the six roles of the appointment center, the management training, and so many other things that we have are for you to print out and give to them in the department meeting, a management meeting, and play the videos that you get. On the online program, you'll get about a 12-minute video a day. On average, sometimes it's a 17-minute video, sometimes a three-minute video, but about 12-minute a video every weekday. And many of those series of videos you could play in a meeting for your people. So we do the training to your people for you, right? And you have these handouts that are all exercises. Where some of them are fill in the blanks, and they have charts and graphs and you know, so forth. So it, it's really a complete program to run your business. Defensive coordinator is something that we talk about. So you wanna make a profit, you gotta get more people involved in helping you make a profit. So we have this idea of the diamond cutter, and it's funny, I'm at Mitsubishi, but the diamond cutter. So what does the diamond cutter do? Diamond cutter takes a rough stone, and by putting it against the wheel, takes a piece, a little bit off, and 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 a little bit off, to create a multifaceted gem that's much more valuable than what he started out with. Well, um, that's kind of like what carving a profit is like. You know, if you're making no money, you're breaking even, congratulations, you just manage 90% of your cash flow properly. Now you gotta get the other 10% right, and it's 1% here, half a percent there, a third of a percent here, right? Uh, point and a quarter over here, right? And you add it all up, and there's your profit. Okay, so uh, we can help you with that. So, look, your business is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. The marketplace is looking at your business and saying, I like that business this much. That's what's happening, right? And when you change your business, the marketplace says, oh, I like this better. I will have, you know, funnel more business to this, uh, this concern, you see? So you are getting the results, uh, uh, the, the marketplace is giving you what you deserve, and, and you personally are getting what you deserve right now. And that's, you know, it could seem harsh to say, like if you're losing money, um, but when I look back in my life and I say, when the times I was struggling, uh, I was getting what I deserved, even though I didn't, you know, I felt like I was working hard and aren't I doing all the right things? I'm working harder, I'm working longer, I deserve more, but I was getting what I deserved. So in order for me to turn this thing around, I gotta turn it around, right? So we say, from the invisible comes the visible. 
That's what it's about. You got to get it in here first for you to get it out there. Right? From nothing comes something. The source of your wealth is inside your head and how you're thinking about things. And in order for you to get different results, you've got to be a new person. You can't be this person, the person you're being right now, the leader you're being right now, the person you're being to all your employees and calling the shots the way you do and making the choices the way you do and be this new leader who thinks differently, thinks bigger and gets exponentially better results at the same time. You can't be this person and this person at the same time. So you've got to be willing to create something different than what you've already created. Some contractors are not willing. Some entrepreneurs are just not willing. Look, I, I'm comfortable in my mess. Is that possible to be comfortable in your mess? Yeah. At least I know how it's going to come out. <laughs> okay? But if you want to get new and better results, right? If you want to grow from a $3 million business to a six or from a six to a 12 or whatever it is and, and, and get it right and reap the rewards, right? Be able to do great work in the world, right? Make a dent in the universe and, and live an extraordinary life. You've got to be a different person because you're not that person yet. So the way the School of Entrepreneurship Online works is... Again, it's $500 a month, so I have 10 minutes left, so this is perfect timing. Uh, it's $500 a month, and you might say, you know, if anybody out there is thinking that that's a lot of money, let me put it in perspective, okay? I sent my daughter to college. She's at uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. 40000 bucks a year, plus, plus, plus. And we send them away. We have no idea what these professors are going to say to her, right? We just trust. And she is being indoctrinated, okay? Let me tell you. She's not being educated. She's being indoctrinated, okay? And we don't even know what she's going to do for the rest of her life. She already changed her major once. She's only a sophomore. You know what you're going to do. You're doing it now, right? Aren't you committed? Right? And you, everything is at stake. You are losing so much money, wasted marketing dollars, wasted sales efforts, where the guys aren't selling or they're selling smaller jobs, they could have done much better. You're losing every day compared to your ideal, what could be, right? I mean, you're losing $500 every hour, probably, you know? Um, you're losing an inefficiency, you're losing in turnover, you're losing in not having the right people, right? You're losing in so many ways. $500 a month, $6,000 a year, it's okay. So I hope I've made my point there. Um, so when you join the School of Entrepreneurship, it's about a three-year curriculum, about. There's no quick fix. There's no overnight, you know, you did this in 15 years, I'm not going to change it in a month, okay? It is an is a, is evolutionary process, right? If, look, if you want a, 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 an incredible view of the world, you can get shot out of a cannon and get a great view, but it's not going to last, okay? Or you can work every day to build brick by brick and build a new floor of the building, and that you'll eventually get a great view that will last. Okay, that's what, kind of what it's like. Uh, so, you, you join and you, you'll start getting, if you join today, you will start getting material, uh, well, provided we can sign you up uh, today. Uh, well, we're, we're, we would take your name and your information and then someone back at our office would get you going and you'll, get con you'll start getting content right away, okay, in your inbox. So what, this is what you do. You wake up in the morning 10 minutes early, you get your coffee, and you open up your laptop and you see, what did I get today? What's my video today? Uh, if there's an exercise, and each one of these represents an exercise, 
we'll ma we make you print it first. We don't let you watch the videos talking about that exercise till you print it. So you print it, color copy, right? And you use, you got the printout in front of you and you're going through it and you're watching the class talking about this idea. So any one of these might have three videos, seven videos, nine videos talking about this idea. We don't overwhelm you, just give you about on average 10 minutes a day. And then you say, what am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with this? That's the question you have to ask yourself. You gotta do something different or you're not, otherwise you're not gonna get any you know, different results. Um, so that's the way it works. And um, you know, knowledge is power, right? Knowledge is power. Uh, it's, and, and then it, it, it's discipline, right? So it used to be the haves and the have-nots. It's no longer the haves and the have-nots, right? It's not, well, I know the king, you know, or uh, I inherited all this land from the, you know, my father or the baron, you know. No, it's not the haves and the have-nots anymore. Everybody has access to the same information. Today, the difference is the wills and the will-nots. That's the difference. So it's those that have self-discipline, and those that don't. Those that make decisions and those that don't. And so that is what makes the difference today. You know, I, I teach another class called the master skill of the 21st century. And I'll tell you what it is. It's the ability to focus our attention. The master skill of the 21st century is the ability to focus our attention. We have this thing in our pocket that is a mass distraction device right, with all the notifications and emails and texts and yada yada, we're the leader. We can't be doing that. We gotta focus our attention on what is most important. We have the content, okay? You gotta control your attention and your discipline. And if you can do that, you will rise to the top 5%, top 1% uh, out there. So, um, so let me go back. So, so this is the... Um, I have a special offer for you, and um, so, sorry? Oh yeah, call to action, yeah. I, it says right here, call to action, don't forget. Uh, all right, so first of all, first of all I wanna say this, look, I, I'll give you my cell phone number, I'll give you my email address. There is a money back guarantee. If you're not happy after a year in the School of Entrepreneurship, we'll refund every penny you ever paid us, okay? I know that's not gonna happen, okay? So there's no risk to you. Um, so there's a money back guarantee, but there's two things you could do today. Number one is you could sign up right now. Number two is you could take a free trial. If you take a free trial, you're gonna get 10 modules of content from the school, and at the end, you have, or during, you have to make a decision, do I wanna sign up, okay? But if you sign up for the free trial, you don't get any freebies. If you sign up for the school and you believe in what I'm saying, you believe I know what I'm doing, uh, we have uh, Paul Gillio here who's in the School of Entrepreneurship. Uh, Paul, where are you? There you are. So he's in the school. You could talk to him about it. He's been in a live class. Uh, and we have um, other contractors you can talk to. But if you think that I'm sincere, that I'm authentic, that I know what I'm talking about, look, just sign up today. And Dave Iannone is here. We have a booth out there. And you could start this process, start this change to be the kind of leader that you need to be to get the results that you say that you want before your time is up here, okay? That's, that's what you do when you sign up for the School of Entrepreneurship. Um, if you sign up today, you get, I'll give you the following. First month free. My book, The Highest Calling, and there's a journal that comes with it and an audio that comes with it. The audio it came out fantastic. I've been listening to audio books my entire life. Uh, if, if you didn't catch it, I didn't go to college, okay? But I consider myself one of the most educated people in any room because of what I've been paying attention to for 35 years. Um, but my audio book, uh, The Highest Calling, you're absolutely gonna love this. But I'll give you the whole set. Um, I will give you a program called The Inner Game of Entrepreneurship. It's an eight hour program. It was a live class that we did with 100 contractors. Then um, another program called Playing the Inner Game, uh, which is a seven hour audio that I did with 100 contractors. Then I will give you a program that I did with Brian Tracy 
an audio program. Uh, Brian Tracy is a friend of mine. Uh, I did a program with Les Brown. I will give you that. Uh, I did a program with Nick Vujicic, the guy with no arms and no legs who was born that way. Um, and so you'll get that. I did a, an audio with Larry Wingett, if you know who he is. Uh, it's your own damn fault guy. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, and I have done these two unique, uh, I've created a new genre of learning audio. And what I've done is uh, put together personal development spoken voice with music in a way that you have never heard anything like this before. And I have two CDs. One is called Masterpiece, and one is called Invictus that just came out uh, a month ago. And so I'll give you those. Okay, so that's $817 value if you sign up for School of Entrepreneurship today. Further, and this is an extra special bonus, whether you use it or not, I hope you do, I have a program called Think Daily Live. So I've been writing this blog called Think Daily that we have tens of thousands of people getting every morning. And I've been doing it since 2009. And I have another one, another one so there's two a day, another one called Think Daily for Business People. And um, we're having our first Think Daily Live event next week, Tuesday and Wednesday in Connecticut at our theater. And um, the, the class is about how to live an extraordinary life. It is for anybody, not just for business people how to live an extraordinary life. What do the top achievers do? What is their uh, philosophies? And what are their habits to get into the top 1%? And so we've got a great group. If you can make it, that's $795 registration. Uh, you can come as my guest for no charge if you sign up for School of Entrepreneurship today. If you can't make it next week, I understand two events and you know back-to-back -back weeks. We will be having another event at some point in the future. The date is not announced yet, but you can get a rain check for the next, the next class. So, that, so you either sign up for the free trial, no freebies, or you sign up for School of Entrepreneurship today. Both, uh, you have a money-back guarantee, and you get uh, $1,500 worth of, um, of freebies. So, so last thing, and I'm just out of time here, right on time, uh, is my flight doesn't leave till 5 o'clock. And this event, I've already got permission from uh, Steve and John that this event le ends at 1240. So I will be right here in this room. I'll be in the lobby at 1240 when it ends. And I will stay. And I will do a one-hour class. I will do a Q&A with you. I'm here for you, OK? So at 1240, I'm staying if anybody has you know, wants to learn more, have questions, I will be here. And of course, I'll be uh, out there at our booth at the break and, and so forth. So uh, whether you join us with in any way uh, at all, I wish you all the luck in the world. And thank you very much.